thank you everyone for coming to this session. Um, my name is Martin Hanzik. I work here at this university and I work in the laboratory. And primarily what I do is I try to create things in the laboratory using chemistry, physics, or whatever else I can find um, that might be classified under this title, this very large umbrella called living technology. I would certainly classify it under um, this title called artificial life. So what we're trying to do here is to create something that has lifelike properties. We're not necessarily trying to create in the laboratory a living cell like a bacterium or like a human. We're trying to create something else that has lifelike properties that may not look anything like a microorganism or bacteria. And that's okay for us. But we just wanted to be sure that it has some very, very interesting properties like what Mark has introduced of uh, life, uh, living systems. And the primary model that I use for my research is called the protocell, and you'll hear about that also in Rachel's talk following mine. Um, what this concept is, is it's a simple chemical model of a living cell, okay? And as Mark uh, introduced, a, a normal biological cell has on the order of millions of different types of molecules, right? They have to work together and organize together to form something that is, that is alive. The challenge for us, people like me who are interested in this kind of thing, as we want to make something that has lifelike properties, maybe some, maybe all lifelike properties in a living organism, using on the order of tens of different types of molecules. So a drastic reduction in complexity, but still has some kind of living property. So this is, this is the challenge. It's a huge challenge, and we may not be able to do it, but this is the model we're playing with. So what I'm doing here today is just show you some examples of what, this, uh, what the protocell looks like, what living technology would look like, and the things that are actually being made today. In order to understand a bit about this, what we're trying to create in the laboratory, these are some of the, uh, the, the goals that, we are, that we're looking at. First of all, um, our artificial organism must have some kind of body. It must have some kind of metabolism, so a process by which it could bring in uh, energy and nutrients so it can grow. And it must have some kind of inheritable information so we could have a storage of, 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 of information in the system that may be replicated. So quite simply, if you, if you couple these two together, the body and metabolism, we can come up with some kind of properties of, of the system, such as movement. So this is one thing I study quite a lot, because when you have something that moves, you can actually see what's going on. And replication. So if you have something that has body and metabolism, perhaps it can eat and it can grow. And if you couple that with the information idea, perhaps you could come up with something that can evolve maybe like biological evolution or something different, but has, uh, have, has the property of evolution. So these are the kinds of hallmarks we're looking for when we do a, a chemical experiment and we try to understand what's happening. How can this even be possible? Well, one way, one tool we have to our advantage is this process called self-assembly. Basically, certain kind of molecules, you mix them together in the test tube, you, millions of these things will come together in a kind of ordered way, semi-ordered way, to form a larger structure. Okay? This happens more or less for free in the right environment. And because this happens more or less for free, people have speculated on what the role of this self-assembly is in living systems. So here we have uh, from Josh Lederberg, 1966. The point of faith is make a polypeptide sequence in the right time, right amounts, and the organization, or self-organization, will take care of itself. This is not far from suggesting that a cell will crystallize itself out of the soup when the right components are present. What he's saying here, in this hypothesis, is that if you had the recipe for life, you just have to mix it up, and you will have life come out. Right. So this, this, was, this was how powerful this idea of self-assembly was in, at that time. And despite, say, about 100 years, so before this even, 100 years of research of trying to create life in a laboratory, no one has been able to do it. There's something more that's needed besi besides self-assembly. But using self-assembly, we could come up with some interesting things, like this protocell model that I, that I made. Here, what we're looking at here is a micrograph using a, a, a microscope. The structures here are about as big as, say, a bacteria cell, okay? And there are several things going on in this, in this micrograph. First, I point to the green stuff uh, are the membrane molecules. This is formed through self-assembly. They've come together and formed these rather large structures. All these structures here are membranes, very similar to the membranes in normal biological cells, but very simple ones. So that will form, say, the body of our artificial organism. Secondly, what's in here is in this part of the, of the micrograph is a little piece of clay. It's a very specific kind of clay, which is actually chemically active, and it could, it could actually transform matter. It acts as a catalyst. 
So this could be, say, a source for metabolism in our primitive organism. And finally, what's in here is the red stuff is RNA. These are, this is like DNA here. And this could be an informational molecule. And what, how this was done was basically I just had a recipe, and I mixed it together, and this thing fell out. And you can look at it, right? So this is all due just to self-assembly. But this is not a living cell. It has some of the interesting architecture of a living cell, but it really kind of stops there. There's not much more you can do uh, with this kind of model. But it's a proof of principle that you can get a lot of things to come together under self-assembly. So just to summarize this little guy here, we got the body and metabolism part together, doesn't quite replicate, okay? If you can't quite replicate, you're not going to be able to inherit anything, so we don't really have inheritable information, even though there is uh, RNA in the system. Evolution is a, a far dream away from what, what we see here. But it's, it's on the road, right? This is a, a completely different type of protocell mo uh, a model that I play with here at the university. And uh, we'll just show the movie here so you can see what it looks like. This is in real time. This is, a, a, this is a, uh, a protocell that you can see by eye. It's big enough to see by eye. You don't need a microscope anymore. And as you can see, first thing it does is it moves around, right? So that's one property of the system that is moving around. And as it moves around, it's leaving a trail behind. It's modifying its environment and doing some kinds of things. So this is what we would, this is, this protocell model, I would say, has, is capable, since it moves, is capable of having some kind of behavior, which we might consider uh, uh, property of living systems. So for example, here's the protocell, again the same one, and basically think about it as moving around and it's basically eating food from the environment. So I'm going to now add a source of food, which is this blue stuff, and then you'll see that the protocell stops what it's doing, realizes there's food there, and moves to the highest point of that gradient and stops. So it's able to uh, not only modify its environment, but sense changes in its environment, sense where the food source is, and move into that food source so it can eat. So this is what living systems do. Right. But we can do it with very simple, if, if you count the number of chemicals that I put into this system, there are five chemicals, and that includes water. Very simple stuff. We can get this stuff to work. Um, here we go, we couple the body with metabolism. In this case, we get out movement, and quite good movement out of the system. And because we have this kind of directional movement that's very sensitive to the environment, we say, well, maybe we can actually evolve or have some program intelligence using the, this basic research. So it's possible to develop, say, some kind of uh, smart materials based on these approaches. There's no DNA here. There's no inheritable information as far as we know. So evolution is far away. So now we, once we start developing these models, we can start playing with them, which is the most fun. So we can start playing games with them. And in this game, you don't have to worry so much about the chemistry, but we're going to have two different players here. These protocells have one kind of chemical, and they're orange. These protocells have one kind of chemical, and they're blue. And the properties of the system are quite simple. You add in a chemical activator to these, and they start just vibrating wildly, these guys here. And you add the same chemical to these, and these come together and fuse into larger and larger droplets. That's the rule, That's the rule of the game. So we can play this here. This is, uh, again, done in the lab. This is fat, sped up a little bit, uh, 8x real time. So here are the populations of protocells. You can see the orange ones like to vibrate, and the blue ones like to come together and fuse. And that's the rule of the game, right? The last one goes in. There it goes. Okay. So I'm glad Mark brought up this idea of emergence, which is a property of living systems. So now we could actually start saying something about emergence. Uh, which is a property of not only complex living systems, but maybe these really simple sim systems. So here in this video, something uh, that's not allowed happens. There are the blue ones. There they are. Ah, something happened. You see what happened? The blue ones are started merging with the orange ones, and that's against the rules. Okay? So we add in the chemical activator, and you see what happens. The blue ones are fusing, and the other ones even the hybrid one now is, 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 is vibrating around. Okay, so it's behaving like an orange one, even though it's a hybrid one. And then another hybrid event that happens, like this. And there we go. Self-division, right? Self-reproduction is happening in this system, right? So this is an example, I would say, very simple systems that give property of emergence. Right, so this is the new rule. This is not my rule, this is their rule. If these fuse together, you get a superfuser. This thing can fuse with anything, whether it's blue or, or orange. 
And if it's large enough, which is what we saw, it will actually replicate right, itself. That's all, all for free. So then we just begin to under, try to imagine that you can get a self-replication system with these things and perhaps get information in the system and we're on our way further along to making this kind of lifelike uh, artificial cell. So here we go. Right, we already talked about this. So, artificial life. This is an interesting quote from Le Duc almost 100 years ago. Actually, this was published in French even before this. He says, the synthesis of life, should it ever occur, will not be the sensational discovery which we usually associate with the idea. So Mark had a good introduction to Venter's synthetic cell, right? He made a synthetic cell, and has it changed your life at all? No, it hasn't changed my life at all. But he made it. I mean, it's not necessarily making life, but it's a step in that direction. And so this is this the idea here. This guy says, well, it's not going to be anything very revolutionary if you start making life. And I agree with this. Uh, if we accept the theory of evolution, then we must... Uh, then the first dawn of the synthesis of life must consist in the production of forms intermediate between inorganic and the organic worlds. So that means between non-living and living uh, forms, which possess only some of the rudimentary attributes of life to which other attributes will be slowly added in the course of development by the evolutionary action of the environment. So this is the way we're going. We start simple and we try to accrue more and more lifelike properties uh, into the system. Usually you can get to a more, something more complex by just tweaking the complexity up a little bit, adding a new molecule, and then something novel might come out of it. So lastly, since this is a living technology section, uh, Mark really introduced this very well. Um, I would say living, uh, living in this part, to try to define what living is, is a material or process that possesses inheritable information, metabolism, body, we talked about this already, uh, movement and, and therefore evolution. Um, this living material uh, or process is naturally scrutinized by ability to survive and reproduce in a varied and often unpredictable environment. So this is kind of like a selection here. And technology is another interesting word, material or process that is produced intentionally to modify the environment in a purposeful way, and technology is scrutinized by its utility and its economy. So we have these kind of interesting words coming together to form living technology. And I think, as Mark said, the major point of this whole evening and this whole day is to ask you, this is the same as before, which technologies would benefit from living properties? So we're putting living properties into material non-living systems now. So which technologies would you like to see that has living properties and how would these change our lives? Because it's not, it's not clear to me how this is all going to affect me. And, and this is the way that it might, right? <laughs> So what we have here is you basically take every kind of technology that we have and we transform it to a living thing, right? And that's what you come up with this picture here, right? But this is, you know, of course, the wrong idea. But what is the right idea for living technology? How is, the, how is our future going to be shaped by these things? So, and I don't have the answer, but I have a lot of questions. So for more information, you could come to visit us at Flint. We're here at SDU. If you want to hear about, well, maybe you'll talk about this, right? Future Venice. We have a website if you want to hear about how protocells are going to save the world. You can come to futurevenice.org here, and that's my email address. You can contact me with any issues. So thank you for your time. <laughs>